All right, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining today, especially taking some time out of your day to join the Zoom meeting, kind of open this up to a discussion in regards to how we built flu and maybe kind of redesign certain aspects of our airplane. Um, we are group one, uh, nicknamed We Build Plane, and we are stationed here at the University of Florida, the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department. I am Alex Gotov, the team lead. I'm Matt Specialty. I'm Mark Harty, the team pilot. I'm Sean Scourn. Manchukina Jamerantu. Yeah, I'm Wilson Matungwa. I'm Marcelo Valdez. I'm Stanley Noel. I'm Matheus Santos. I'm Max Zang. And I'm Sergio Lopez. And so for today, we'll be covering some of the elements from brainstorming all the way to final flight in regards to actually designing, building, and flying the plane. Um, as shown here, we have provided numbers for the slides in case you want to go back to them later in the future. But in regards to actually making this plan, everything had to start with the initial estimates. But um, with the initial estimates, we have requirements that are set by the instructor themselves. In this case, we need to make an unmanned electrically powered radio controlled aircraft. Uh, it had to be able to take off within 40 feet using ground roll rather than vertical takeoff. We had to complete three laps as shown in the image up in the slides in under five minutes. Specifically, we need to have no significant damage during takeoff, flight, or landing. And finally, we had to make sure all the electronics were off the shelf due to safety slash um, not being able to manufacture some of it in-house. From these components, we were able to derive some requirements, specifically maneuverability at high speeds by looking at previous designs from uh, some other semesters in order to create and iterate to, to produce a better aircraft and high responsiveness to pilot inputs due to an experienced pilot. Uh, but now on to the initial essence. All right, so prior to actual manufacturing of the aircraft, we found it important to uh, create some initial estimates to see what we're actually working with. Uh, so we did that using some historical data, using other RC airplanes, and also an RC airplane that we had on hand, which was an F-22 Raptor. So we were able to generate from the F-22 Raptor, measuring its weight and its thrust, a target thrust to weight ratio that we were working towards. Uh, using that, we were able to calculate our target weight of 2,480 grams. Um, and also, we based our uh, thrust and power estimates off a 70 millimeter EDF motor. Uh, we picked that based on the type of aircraft that we were trying to manufacture, and we got those numbers from the actual manufacturer of the EDF. Uh, we got a target power to weight ratio as well and compared that to racer type aircraft um, that we were able to see online. So we also did to generate a target speed for our estimated takeoff. Uh, and get lift to drag ratios. We compared NACA 0014, 0016, 18, and 20 airfoils. Uh, we ran those and we found that we got a 78.34 lift to drag ratio. Um, and we picked a symmetrical airfoil because that generated the smallest lift to drag possible. Uh, we also approximate our Reynolds number based on environmental uh, conditions in the area of the runway that we were going to be using. So our targeted wing area uh, is based off of uh, the material that we're using, the lightweight PLA that's providing class. Uh, we, are, we, we were able to get wing cube loading ranges based off of racer type aircraft um, in the RC industry. And we got the numbers that are shown there. Um, we also calculated our uh, wing cord based off the lift needed to meet the target speed that we calculated prior. Um, next for our airfoil selection, uh, we picked the uh, three NACA airfoils on the right corner um, due to like the symmetrical against cambered airfoil. Since we would like to have an aerobatic aircraft, uh, it is better to have a symmetrical airfoil for um, the maneuverability since it can provide the same amount of lift whether it's upside or um, downside. Uh, next, um, since at, we are trying to fly at high speed, that will overcome the low CL of uh, the symmetrical airfoil. As you can see, the, um, the, the CL can be uh, twice as low as for like the next camber. Uh, and lastly, we chose the symmetrical airfoil because at the high speed, the camber airfoil will produce a lot of lift, which um, will um, bring the nose up, uh, requiring the pilot to uh, push the nose down, which uh, uh, is hard to control uh, for our pilot. And lastly, symmetrical airfoil has a center of pressure. Does that not change uh, compared to camber airfoil? Um, at uh, flight, uh, flight condition, uh, it is it was uh, seen simulated with XFLR5 that uh, NACA 0016 has the 
uh, highest uh, center of lift, uh, not center of the coefficient of lift. Um, and uh, the coefficient of drag is very similar compared to the other uh, NACA airfoils. So that was um, easy to decide. It also gives us for stall angles, it gives us a higher range for our pilot to uh, play with the aircraft. Um, next for, for the uh, maximum uh, fitness location, uh, we compared uh, from 20% to 80% from the leading edge and it was seen that the maximum was uh, at 26% from uh, the leading edge. And again, for the stall angle, uh, the, the maximum was uh, at around 18, which gives our uh, pilot a better range of control again. So the stall angle was not very into uh, a condition to select the uh, airfoil. And all these data were simulated using x 5 but validated through a uh, wind tunnel uh, experiment using similar uh, NACA airfoils. Um, to make sure that our data is reliable. As for our wing design, the base of which is on fire jets such as the F-16 and F-18 Hornet due to high speed and maneuverability. Uh, as can be seen in the model, we have uh, half a wingspan of 838 uh, millimeters, along with a leading edge uh, sweep of 15 degrees. Uh, this combines to result in a wing reference area of 0.359 meters squared which with the increased size allows, helps us to generate more lift. Uh, the one vertical location was uh, placed in the middle due to the neutral uh, stability to help us with our maneuverability goal. And it produced the least amount of drag with, or compared to the other uh, vertical location positions. Uh, furthermore, the aspect ratio uh, became uh, 7.828. And this high aspect ratio is towards our favor because it pushes the wingtips further apart and reduces the portion of the wing exposed to wingtip forces. Uh, the taper ratio uh, became 0.38, and this taper ratio, along with our uh, wind sweep and our zero degree uh, wind twist, uh, helps result in a lift distribution that is near the ideal elliptical uh, amount. Uh, furthermore, uh, no incidence angle was deemed necessary for our design, and no dihedral was added directly to the fact that the wind sweep added 1.5 degrees of effective um, dihedral, and adding any more dihedral would just add more controllability, which would also reduce our goal of maneuverability. Um, no canals were deemed uh, necessary for our goal as well. And our wind thickness was made to be 0 0.4 millimeters to reduce the cost, material, and time to print the entire wing. Uh, the wind tips are great wind tips as well. Moving forward, this uh, plot demonstrates the ideal and the computational uh, lift distributions uh, due to our combination, as we stated, of taper ratio, untwisted uns wings, and 15 degrees swept wings. Uh, as can be seen, our computational lift distribution is near the ideal elliptical lift distribution goal, which reduces the amount of induced drag. For our wingtip side, as I mentioned, it was uh, raised wingtips, which help reduce the amount of wingtip voices generated due to the minimized uh, core length at the wingtip. And XFLR five analysis were conducted to show that during takeoff conditions of 10 degrees of angle of attack and 10 degrees of flat deflection, our coefficient lift had a relative percent increase of 3.6, and our coefficient of drag had a relative percent difference decrease of 4.196%. Our ailerons served, uh, our ailerons was towards the wing tips, and our flaps were toward uh, the roots of the wing. Uh, Inons were there to provide assistance with uh, controllability for roll and pitch. And meanwhile, flap was mainly there to the purpose of help generate enough lift during takeoff. They were also made to be uh, slotted wings to help with the uh, lift distribution. Uh, both of them have hinge points along the top, and they compromise about 30% of the core length and feature a five degree leading edge uh, sweep. Uh, yeah. Going forward for the the uh, flap analysis, as we see over here, for 0, 10, and 30 degrees uh, flap deflection, we saw an increase of maximum lift generated from 37 newtons to 46 to 54 newtons. However, this also resulted in a decrease in uh, angle of attack relative. It went from 14 degrees all the way to 8 degrees. However, we deemed that for our flight, the 10 degree uh, flap deflection would be enough to generate lift to get off the ground. 
uh, the following shows our complete wing disassembled. And what we see here is that the wing, the main section was comprised of five wing sections including the wing tip connected by connectors that are divided by the spar that goes along the inside. Um, the bottom wireframe drawing also shows a plate that would serve to hold both the servos for the aileron and the flap. And the ailerons and the flaps are also comprised of two separate pieces that are connected by a single connector at the center and have um, caps at the ends. For analyzing the load bearing capability of our wing, beam theory and the calyx for shear flow in thin walled closed sections was used. Finite element analysis was not used. Here you see the, um, the cross section of the wing shape minus the flap area with three different um, spar shapes that were considered. They were positioned at the thickest point of the airfoil to allow for the largest um, cross section area for the most amount of uh, um, load bearing capability. The spar was figured to be 3D printed along with the rest of the wing for ease of manufacture. A MATLAB code was programmed to automatically calculate the moment of inertia and, and uh, shear flow at each spanwise location to um, analyze the stresses along the wing. Here are the uh, equations used where the shear stress was calculated with uh, the shear flow Q, which was calculated from the point where shear is assumed to be zero at the top of the wing, all the way over to where shear is the greatest at the centroid of the wing. Um, maximum bending stress was calculated at the top and the bottom of the thickest part of the wing, where that point is the furthest from the wing centroid. For initial estimates, an ideal elliptical lift distribution was assumed. This gave us a bending moment of 34 for uh, newton meters and a, and a max shear of 97.2 newtons. Here you see the, um, the maximum bending stress occurs at the red dot at 9.26 megapascal. Well, the maximum shear stress at the blue dot is 3.54 uh, megapascals. This is the list, lift distribution that we have obtained from, from X foil with the actual wing or the shape we've, uh, we've designed, producing the total lift force of 194.4 Newtons. Next slide, this, um, this produces the max stresses in our wing with a max bending moment stress of almost nine megapascals and a max shear of 3.57 megapascals. Even considering a minimum thickness of the wing and no spar at all, our maximum bending stress was about nine megapascals, which is well less than the published yield stress of the lightweight PLA we planned on using. But this stress is compressive on the top of the wing where buckling was a major concern. For this reason, we incorporated a spar with the thickness of 0.4 millimeters, the minimum thickness that would uh, that would be used to stiffen the top of the wing and brace it against the bottom of the wing. In addition to this spar, it was assumed that the connectors of each individual section of the wing would contribute to uh, stiffening the top of the wing to further prevent its buckling. For the design, we decided to go with uh, a conventional design. This is because it's the easiest one to design and it, will, it, and it was adequate enough for the objective of the mission. Um, we located the center of pressure for both the vertical tail and the horizontal tail to be as far as possible from the center of gravity at 0.56 meters uh, for the vertical tail and 0.55 meters for the horizontal tail. Also, we designed the um, tail based on the parameters that were recommended by the textbook uh, for the area, aspect ratio, paper ratio, and set angle. But after running a stability analysis during the research part, we came to the conclusion that using the original parameters, the plane will be unstable. So we had to 
modify them and alterate the dimensions to the ones that are seen on the table right now. But for uh, static stability analysis, uh, we. Um, the reason that we choose stabilators over a conventional tail were mostly for the greater um, control surface that they provide. That means that we are going to have more maneuverability. And in the case we will encounter a stall, having a uh, um, bigger surface will um, help the pilot overcome this difficulty and go back to straight flight easier. Um, also, stabilators are lighter and will be easier to manufacture since there are less parts involved. And one of the disadvantages is that they will make the plane a little hard, more challenging to fly. But since we have an experienced pilot, um, the disadvantage was discarded. For the servos, um, we mounted the stability servos adjacent to the uh, fuselage and the and the stabilators and the one for the rudder we mounted in into we embedded it into the tail. Um, this way we avoided long pushovers that to bend and alter the functioning of the stabilators while they are on the air. And um, also we designed the rudder based on the parameters that you see on the screen. And the final dimensions for the rudder were 0 0.14 meters square for the area. A uh, span of 0.196 meters and a uh, total core, uh, a maximum core of 0 0.74 meters. All right. For our static stability analysis, uh, we successfully designed our aircraft to be statically stable by fulfilling all the requirements for static stability. So, for all moments, uh, the, the first equation, uh, as you can see in the right hand side of the equation, the first two uh, value, uh, the first two parts of the equation, <clears throat> and uh, uh, steady and level flight, uh, they cancel each other. And the last uh, part, that's uh, z is of v. <clears throat> that part is the uh, negative part, uh, as we derived it to be for the pitch uh, moment. Uh, uh, the equation below that, uh, you see the vectors for x of uh, the wing. So that's the uh, gravity. Uh, CG of the wing and uh, CG of the horizontal, uh, horizontal stabilator. They're all vectors that are negative because they are after the main CG of the aircraft, uh, which means that uh, the pitch moment is also less than zero. For your moment, uh, the equation that you see, all those are magnitude for uh, different values and they're all positive, uh, which indicates that your moment was also calculated to be uh, positive value. So aircraft was statically stable. Uh, on top of that, uh, running the XO5 uh, analysis, uh, it also showed that our aircraft is static stable because we, uh, we were able to do the dynamic analysis because XO5 won't let you, uh, won't let you do this dynamic analysis, dynamic stability analysis if your aircraft is not statically stable. So our aircraft was statically stable. Moving on to dynamic stability, uh, uh, as you can see, our flight responses for eigenvalues for our flight responses for longitudinal. Uh, starting with longitudinal, our uh, short period response was uh, what we expected to be our eigenvalue. For the uh, real part of the eigenvalue was negative, uh, which means we uh, we have a damped uh, response. For full weight mode, uh, however, you can see that our real part is positive, so we were not stable in full weight mode. But uh, we understand that full grade response is, uh, is is very easy for the pilot to correct it uh, when it comes to it, and it's very close to zero. So that was not an issue, and we did not encounter any any uh, problems with full grade response during flight. For lateral directional responses, uh, with with the values you see uh, right there, we we expected all of them to accept for the spiral divergence, which has a positive uh, real part. Uh, but otherwise, for dash roll and roll convergence. Uh, we, all, we all had uh, damping uh, modes. So we were dynamically stable. On top of that, uh, our stabi uh, dynamic stability analysis on XL5 uh, gave us uh, a trim speed of 37.2 meters per second. Our target trim uh, speed was 30 meters per second. So our design also was pretty good. And uh, angle of attack of uh, almost one degree for trim.
So for propulsion, our main key feature was having a ducted fan within the fuselage itself. Some of the reasons of choosing an EDF would be a higher thrust density, better efficiency, as well as experimenting with a design that was rather unique and would allow us to learn more about. In addition, the power to weight ratio and thrust to weight were provided from the initial estimates, and the flight was built off of the required uh, class set of rules. In addition, fan design was mostly provided by the manufacturer. We did not alter what was provided to us, and ducts had to be considered as we need to provide airflow for the propulsion system inside the fuselage. For actually choosing which motor, uh, specifically for the EDF, we created a decision matrix. The first three shown are 64 millimeters in diameter, whereas the last one is 70 millimeters. From this spec sheet, or from this uh, decision matrix specifically, we see that the power fund won. However, due to external considerations, as well as trying to maybe minimize the size of the aircraft, we ended up choosing the B-Best Life uh, 3500 kb. From the actual weighing factors, you can see that thrust generator was the most important because we wanted to make sure we were achieving sufficient speed to get off the runway, as well as current draw and power to weight ratio to ensure that our flight could be successful once it's up in the air and has enough power. All right, so now that we have our motor chosen, uh, that can bring us to our electrical system that we can compile. Uh, so we have a 50 amp ESC that could uh, handle the amperage draw from our EDF motor. That ESC was cooled uh, using cheater fans. Uh, we have a battery to power that. It's a four cell battery that's provided in class. It's got 3,300 milliamp hours. Um, the pilot provided uh, his own transmitter and that could communicate with the spectrum receiver that was in class or provided to in class. And then uh, we chose uh, three different types of servos, um, one of which is a 17 grams uh, micro class servo. It's a metal servo. These uh, were used for the stabilators. We have a uh, we have two plastic servos that are also micro class used for the ailerons, and then we have uh, sub micro class servos. We have two for the flaps and one for the nose wheel steering, as they are not critical to flight. So our fuselage design uh, attempted to consider all these different aspects. We got a total weight of seven hundred ninety point two grams, and we modeled it off of a minimum drag airflow, which is the NACA 18 uh, we ensured that our fuselage was hollow and thin walled, as you can see in the bottom right section cut. Uh, and this was just so we could minimize our weight and the drag was minimized as well. Our diameter at the largest portion of the fuselage was uh, 125 millimeters. And this was to accommodate the size of the EDF motor that we selected. As you can see, uh, we have two ducts offset uh, from the skin so that way we could prevent uh, boundary layer issues. And these converged at the center of our fuselage so that way we could get a sufficient airflow. Our length was uh, 1,346 millimeters. Uh, and this provided us a slenderness ratio of 10.7 when considering our maximum diameter. Now we use the 75% of the wingspan rule of thumb that we got from our literature review. And that gave us 1,257 millimeters. So we're about hundred millimeters longer than is generally suggested. Uh, but this was necessary so that way we could incorporate all of our different electronics. Uh, the air ducts, as mentioned, they're one on each side. They had a total inlet area of 3,318 square millimeters. Uh, and this was based off of 110% of our fan swept area. And so this was calculated with a fan blade diameter of 64 millimeters and a propeller nut diameter of 25 millimeters. That gave us 2,725 square millimeters and 110% of that would have given us 3,000. So we included a factor of safety ensure that we can get enough airflow so that we can generate our maximum thrust. For the landing gear, it was decided that the best design that we would, could go for was a tricycle, mostly because we don't need the extra ground clearance that a tail grader would give us if we don't have a propeller in the front, and because tricycles are better for um, high-speed maneuver and like high-speed takeoff and high-speed landings. For the stability, we Consider that we needed at least one inch, one inch of ground clearance, uh, but take off at an angle of pitch of 15 degrees. And for that, we located the landing gear 5.5 inches after the center of gravity of the aircraft. In the lateral side, it was determined that the aircraft needed at least 2.48 inches on each side in order to make the aircraft. Um, stable enough to receive wind gusts from the sides. So we decided to use a factor of safety of 2.5 and make the total distance between the 
uh, landing gear in the lateral direction of 12.48 inches. For the tire wheel selection, we decided that the best way to go would be 2.5 inches in diameter and rubber wheels. Rubber wheels were chosen over the other materials because also they are a little bit more expensive. They offer less friction and they offer greater resistance compared to the counterparts. And for the structure, we purchased our landing gear from Amazon and eBay, and we modeled a couple of structures to adapt it to the fuselage. That way, we could integrate the um, parts that we got online to the, to the fuselage that we designed ourselves. Our plane was assembled using 3D printed components. The material chosen was lightweight PLA due to its low uh, density of 530 kilograms per meter cube. Um, the components were bonded together with cyanoacrylate, um, and we considered uh, the surface area as more surface area equals uh, higher bond strength, but also uh, has uh, uh, results in additional weight. So we had to find a balance between the two. All right, so having gone through all of the design and manufacture processes, uh, this brings us to our test flight day. We can go to the video. Um, so as you can see in this video, I'm kind of taxiing. Uh, the whole purpose of this um, uh, was to perform a high-speed taxi run in order to kind of get the feel of the aircraft before actually lifting off. So potentially bringing the nose off the ground a little bit and then just le leaving it on the runway. However, we had a slight CG issue and it was a little bit of a gusty day. So the plane uh, popped off the ground like that. I was able to kind of let it feather down to the ground. Um, and you can kind of see that our, our uh, landing gear gave way as well as the wing had actually uh, broken off. Uh, so we did some minor repairs there uh, by adding tape to the top surface of the wing as well as the bottom. And we added some weight. We actually added a little too much weight. Um, and then we were able to remove some of that weight and correct a little bit of the CG there if we want to play the next video. Uh, here you can see uh, another takeoff on the same day where uh, we had enough weight to be able to kind of fix the CG issue, uh, but then again, we did not have enough thrust, uh, as you see right here when I start turning downwind, um, that I just didn't have enough thrust to keep it up in the air, so I had to ditch it in the grass. So as Mark mentioned, uh, we did find a few issues after that first uh, test flight day. Uh, mainly, we discovered that we had a lower than optimal thrust to weight ratio. Um, this was because of after trying to correct for the CG issue, um, we ended up adding too much weight to uh, su successfully fly. Um, furthermore, we discovered that uh, we had optimized our motor too much and did not account for uh, duct losses, um, as well as the additional weight that we ended up adding, um, which further lowered our thrust to weight ratio. Um, furthermore, we assessed that the landing gear that we had ended up using uh, suffered from a mechanical failure after that landing. Um, you could see in that picture in the top right, uh, the landing gear sort of uh, kicked out from underneath the plane. Um, and we also discovered that uh, after using uh, attempting to use foam tires, uh, we uh, assessed that there was too much friction between the tires and the ground. And those were things to correct. Um, so next, we decided to implement some solutions. So the first solution we implemented was we increased the ducted fan size to an 80 millimeter, 80 millimeter ducted fan. Um, in order to account for this, we also had to adjust the duct geometry to fit the new fan. So we increased the size of the exhaust duct. Um, we truncated the back half or back 210 millimeters of the duct in order to further reduce the losses in the duct. And we also uh, made the inlet area larger and use a less eccentric shape for the duct. Um, in order to account for the CG issues, we relocated the motor 210 millimeters forward um, to help alleviate that issue. And we also, in order to account for the truncated uh, exhaust, we relocated the tail and the vertical, uh, vertical tail and the stabilator uh, above the fuselage and used the tail strake in order for aerodynamic and structural gain. Um, after doing this, a few things had to be recalculated. Mainly, we wanted to ensure that the CG was where we wanted it to be, which was more forward than it was previously. Um, then we had to verify that the moving the tail section upwards would not destabilize the aircraft. And through our calculations, none of the eigenvalues changed in sign. Uh, the real part never changed in sign, so we were not destabilized by moving them. And then we also had to test that we uh, had a desirable thrust to weight ratio, um, which 
with the new motor we tested uh, increased from 0 0.25 to 0 0.63. All right, so uh, here you can see the electrical system post redesign. Uh, you can see the only things that are changed are the is the power system. So we have now a three wing eighty millimeter EDF motor that's powered uh, by uh, a battery that's a six cell battery, four thousand milliamp hours, and it is supported by eighty amp ESC. Uh, which brings us to our second test flight day. Uh, luckily, successful test flight day. We can play video number two. Um, so here is the, uh, we got a full video here. Um, so we're going to start from takeoff. Uh, and you can kind of see the takeoff is a little, uh, little squirrely in the beginning there. However, I was able to stabilize the plane uh, and bring us up in altitude. And then we went to complete our laps. So here you can see, uh, I think this might be a little pass. We can keep this here. Uh, so the aircraft is coming in. Uh, I'm kind of setting up a little bit for an approach. Just kind of want to get a feel for it, but when it's a little lower, so I'm going to conduct a low pass right here. Uh, and you can kind of see that the wind's kind of jostling around a little bit, that the plane is returning to its own flight. I didn't really have to put that much uh, character or uh, corrections in for any of the wind, uh, just mainly for the desired orientation I wanted the aircraft in. Uh, and here I'm going to be setting up for a landing approach. Uh, a little bit of a sneak peek there. So I'm coming in, you can see I kind of flare right a little too early and I kind of stalled the airplane, uh, but able, I was able to have enough power, a little increase of power and with the stabilators, get the airplane on the ground, a little bit of bouncy landing there. Um, and we had a successful test flight. We can also play the low pass prior to landing, just a quick little uh, snippet of the plane going by. Um, really nice to fly. It was awesome, had a lot of power. Uh, I was not flying it at 100% the entire time, which is great. Uh, mainly staying around 80% throttle just to kind of keep it a little slower. And we did land with about 30 degrees of flaps. So our next steps are to do carbon fiber wing manufacturing. Right now, uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, we measured the first wing and there was a reduction of 24.2% uh, weight for the wing weight. So uh, we went a little bit over, but if you guys have any questions now, we'll open up the room and uh, we hope that you were able to enjoy some of the slides. Thank you so much for your presentation. Great job. Uh, let's ask a question from uh, this, 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 this audience. Ask a question first. You go first, Paul. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, awesome. First of all, I want to commend you guys. Um, you know, you could have picked a simple plane and then you decided to go with a more complicated one. So, I, and then you're also still iterating on it, which is great. Um, so I'm really glad that you guys thought outside of the box about it. Um, you know, it's not easy. And you guys had a successful set of test flights. So uh, I guess great job, uh, great presentation. I had some questions uh, relating to more of the wing design section, um, which I kind of wanted to focus on. Uh, I think it was further up, um, I think eight or something. Yeah, so the so the cruise speed you had uh, 67 miles an hour. I was curious where that came from and why you needed to go so quickly. Um, so I can I can answer that. Um, so flying previous airplanes, um, I do have a model of the same size, actually kind of a little smaller uh, that can go 100 miles an hour or over 100 miles an hour in a shallow dive. So kind of picking around. Uh, that cruise speed that you mentioned that we have on this slide there uh, just kind of sounded a little reasonable there because we didn't want to push uh, to go for speed. It was more of, um, of just a reasonable flight for a jet. Air speed. So did you like go that fast or did you go slower than that? Uh, say that again. I'm sorry. Did you go 67 miles an hour or did you go slower? Because it looked like in the pictures it definitely went slower. Uh, it's it's a little hard to say just perspective. Uh, an increased size of air, like size of an airplane kind of makes it a little harder for to determine exactly how fast or an estimate. Um, I suspect that it could have gone that fast or even faster. It's kind of really hard to say. Uh, I like I said, I wasn't really pushing the throttle 100% the entire time. I was more just relaxed on the throttle, just trying to keep it easy and make sure um, because uh, flight expansion testing will will happen later on once we complete the carbon fiber wings. Yeah, um, I was just curious because 
I, the requirement is in five minutes for um, a few laps. So um, we also didn't use our full throttle. Um, and we, ours had more than enough time. Um, but as far as the uh, NACA 0016, why was that chosen as opposed to a Cambridge airfoil? I, I was listening, but I couldn't get like a definitive reason for that. Um, so um, I can answer that. So basically because of our like derived um, our derived uh, um, like requirements or derived objective, we wanted like a maneuverable, uh, like very controllable uh, aircraft that can do aerobatic, uh, um, aerobatic um, maneuvers. Um, so symmetrical airfoil would allow us to go upside down uh, with the same uh, lift, even if it's like up here or like upside down. Also, since we plan to like have a high speed aircraft, we even with uh, like low, low coefficient of lift, we'll still uh, generate enough lift to, uh, to have like a cruise uh, uh, steady level flight. Um, so uh, having a Cambridge airfoil was not really necessary to generate lift. And then finally, um, because a Cambridge airfoil with high speed, it will generate so much lift at, uh, um, as you can see, like the values, it, it doubles and even triples, uh, almost like tri triple quadruple for the NACA 44 compared to like the symmetrical airfoil, which will result in like a nose up uh, uh, airplane will, that will require the pilot to like push down the aircraft a lot more than having a symmetrical airfoil. Um, uh, so that, that is kind of like control, controllability, uh, side of view, like aspect of it, um, um, to make sure it's like, pilot don't have to uh, correct the flight for a lot of times. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I just was wondering why it needed to be an acrobatic aircraft if that wasn't part of the design description. Um, like you have, you said that you chose a symmetrical airfoil because if the plane goes upside down, but when when would you need to go upside down? Yeah, um, so I, I can't see that. The, 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 the process of the flight is just in a loop. So that's why I was curious. I would say for the product description specifically, uh, these airfoil selections would have probably been something else. Um, but for us, we wanted to at least kind of go a little bit more than just the project description, as well as try to make it so, number one, we can try to get the, the laps finished quicker, as well as being able to do banks a bit smoother, as well as later down the road with carbon fiber aircraft, kind of do, I guess, more of a show with the aircraft in addition to just doing um, these laps. So it was more so just the fact that we wanted to kind of experiment more than just with the project the description, if that answers your question. Yeah, I wasn't saying that you did anything wrong. I was just honestly curious. I mean, it's really cool. I um, I like the fact that, you know, it was everything that was required and then more. Um, but uh, yeah, I was just curious why, why acrobatic, but I guess if the intended purpose later on is to not just fly in circles, that makes sense. Um, and then, well, the other thing was you're saying as a reason for choosing the symmetrical airfoil, um, that it would just generate too much lift, but would you not just be able to create a smaller wing then instead of the larger wing? Um, if you're still within the design requirements, would you not um, just use a Cambridge airfoil if you had less, less size of a wing? Uh, I'll answer, yeah. So, I mean, you are right. That, I mean, that's true. You can get rid of lift just by decreasing the size of the wing. Um, that's hundred percent true. However, um, if, if you're flying faster and you like, for instance, our aircraft, we didn't have an instance angle with the wing with respect to the fuselage. So if we have a cambered airfoil, eventually going fast enough to some point where there's going to be a pitch moment generated, uh, which will cause the nose to be high, um, and, or in some of the correction and the pilot's going to have to put an input in 
that will have to counteract that. Uh, rather, a uh, symmetric airfoil, if the pilot is flying and they're flying at a high enough airspeed to where now you're really starting to get, uh, like, because like at zero angle of attack, your, your camera airfoil is making lift. So I don't want to necessarily have to be as a pilot pushing the nose down um, in order to negate the effects of the lift in order to fly steady level flight uh, because I'm flying at a higher speed. Uh, and with the symmetric airfoil, if it's, it's more comfortable as a pilot to be able to pull the stick back and hold, uh, hold up an AOA to, to in order to maintain steady level flight, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, I had, so another thing was you, for the um, vortices, like your wingtips, I was curious, uh, aside from the fact that like, um, I guess, hold on, before I move on, I just had a quick question regarding, uh, like what, aside from lift and CO over TB, um, what else did you like look into in terms of your like what wing choice? Um, like thickness, uh, stall angle, as far as that goes, those are just these uh, two parameters. Yeah, so at least with the, at least with the wing selection itself, or rather the airfoil selection, uh, we did look at different thicknesses, uh, as well as different locations of that thickness along the cord. However, the key characteristics that we looked into while adjusting those parameters were specifically the coefficient of lift, coefficient of drag, as well as the stall angles to ensure that the pilot has enough of an envelope to operate. So those were pretty much the three main characteristics we looked at. But wouldn't the stall angle uh, decrease with a symmetric airflow versus a cambridge? Typically speaking. Like you'd have a, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Uh, with a symmetric airfoil, you'd have a lower stall angle than you would with a cambered airfoil. Oh, so at least from our data that we obtained for the different airfoils, uh, specifically shown here, we noted that the pretty much the stall angle was about the same for most of them. And we assume that for the rest of the other NACA airfoils that weren't necessarily the oh, oh, 12, like pretty much the 12 variant. If that makes sense. So it should be where each individual airfoil is going to have its own critical angle of attack. And just by adding camber, you're essentially just increasing uh, the amount of the coefficient lift that it can produce. Yeah, um, when we did this last semester, we conducted a trade study. Not that you had to specifically do that, but in order to narrow it down, um, and it kind of helped us to figure out what was what we really cared about um, and narrow down our decision. Um, I guess it depends what you're looking for. Um, I, won't, I won't beat this horse to death, but um, I was just curious if, that, if there were any other requirements that you were looking at. Uh, and then the, the vortice generators you have on your wing, could you like walk me through um, why you came up with this specific shape? Because I'm pretty curious. So specifically uh, for the wingtips, um, since it does go to a small uh, core length of approximately 12.2 uh, millimeters, it uh, limits the amount of lift generated at the wingtips due to core length, which therefore decreases the amount of wingtip voices generated. And as we can see over here, that helps because it increased our coefficient lift by approximately 3.6% uh, compared to, uh, and also decreased our coefficient of drag approximately 4.1 percent because uh, that's what resulted from our XFLR5 uh, analysis where we had our wing with and with the weight wing tips and without uh, the red wing tips. So I hope down that was that. Did, did you iterate between angles to find this or did you just add a long one and go with that? Because the numbers I guess are uh, not even. So I was curious if you find like a, a maximum there or you just arbitrarily uh, you know, not that that's bad. I was just wondering if you should settle on those numbers through like different iterations or just picking them. Um, so so we, we didn't really actually iterate per se, like you were saying. We kind of looked at aircraft that, or full scale aircraft that did have rake wing tips and tried to mimic the proportionality there. Um, so. 
And then um, you were mentioning, if I'm, I wrote down in my notes that you wanted to model an F-16 slash F-18 uh, wing. Why specifically those if your flight envelope has a much lower velocity than what these wings are designed for? Well, because the, the, the speed at which that they fly, of course, the Reynolds number is important, but um, typically they're made for high subsonic uh, and supersonic flow conditions for which uh, I guess the, their optimal use is. Um, so I was just curious why specifically those if they're designed for a different purpose. Uh, I, guess, I guess you can kind of consider that the, the starting off point to jump in just the wing center so that we didn't just uh, throw wing designs and values at a wall. Just because the fact that they do have the uh, high capabilities for maneuverability and generating speed, which met our project requirement. Okay. Uh, I think we may have. Oh, one last thing uh, before I let Jacob and uh, Professor uh, speak. Um, the CG was really important. Uh, for us at least, and it was kind of the defining factor along with weight, why a different design of last semester didn't take off. Um, but I was curious, since you moved your CG, um, where your actual CG was and how you tested that. Yeah, so so the quick answer to testing that is fully assembling the airplane. I mean, obviously you can do it in, in simulations and that estimate the weight and kind of like balanced out there on paper. However, uh, when you fully assemble the airplane, it might be a little different than what you estimated. So to do that, you just can line upside down or right side up, doesn't matter. And you hold your fingers up and you can then find the position of the CG there. Um, so then assuming where you know where your central pressure is on your wing and other components like that, then you can determine references there. Did you um, do that for the specific plane? Because uh, it looks like when you were taking off and um, when you were flying, it was uh, flying with a little bit of pitch up. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is when we tested our airplane uh, before we even flew it, we tried to align the CG at least at the corner cord of the wing uh, in order to create at least neutral or stabilizing features of the aircraft. Um, given that your motor is at the aft portion of the airplane, um, when you added your weights, I think it would have benefited to try to match the quarter cord um, and there or go forward so that your plane was, uh, I guess, more stable and most likely easier to fly. Uh, I was just curious if you thought of that. Well, so yeah, like that, that's what the issue was on the first test flight that we had our CG out of, out of order. We didn't have that uh, in the correct location. However, on the second uh, test flying day, we did have it's uh, relatively near that uh, quarter core, like you mentioned, wasn't exactly there, but it was nearby. Uh, I think it was within like, you know, like half an inch or so. Um, so uh, it just had to do also that there was quite a bit of, of wind that day. So the, the, the takeoff kind of had a little bit to do with the dust there uh, during that day. Um, the nose up attitude during the flight by, as you see, and you mentioned on the video, uh, it has to do with the fact that there is a symmetric airfoil. So at zero angle attack, we're not generating lift. So as a pilot, I do need to keep the stick back. And I actually did have the flaps down at 10 degrees, which helps us there as well. So, um, yeah. Um, the final thing I have is, I know this is the final, but I thought of, um, when you have your ducts in front of your motor, um, what is the cross-sectional area I guess not number, but um, like trend that you observe because your two inlets uh, somewhat mimic, like you said, fighter jets, um, which of course have much lower uh, total pressure ratios than what you'd see. Um, so I was curious if this was just a design it for fun, because I know that that was kind of like how the group was working with the honestly. Pretty cool, uh, but I was wondering why your section actually 
instead of converge and diverges when you begin meet up. They converge towards towards the end, but your does your overall inlet area versus what you see at the motor uh, follow that trend in order to accelerate the subsonic flow? So if I if I understand your question correctly, are you asking why the inlets start outside before coming in? I, I guess what I'm saying is your total cross-sectional area before, um, or I guess right after the inlet and the total cross-sectional area of your duct before the fan, does it get larger or smaller? So currently, right, we have our, our two ducts, each of them split in half would be half of our total inlet area. Now, as it comes in and converges, it does decrease a little bit because if you think about the inside of the fuselage, there's less area in there. But uh, it, in a way, it was more for airflow and, as you mentioned, for looks, uh, because we needed the inlets or the duct, of course, but uh, the reason it was chose to look the way it does is to model the fighter jet. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get at is for a subsonic flow, you'd want a converging section if you're not using a CD nozzle in order to accelerate the flow, both from isentropic relations and just standard Bernoulli's principles. So I'm curious if you decrease or increase the uh, area before the fan a lot more than right before it, whether that would um, help with some of those thrust problems and friction and loss problems that you had um, initially, and then I guess increase what you have currently. Um, just, oh, that's Siri. Um, and then I was just curious what you thought about that going forward since you're still iterating from what I see. Um, so if I understand what you're asking correctly, um, we did notice that um, we when we had made this version that's shown on the screen here, um, the inlets was a bit too eccentric in its shape. Uh, uh, by that, I mean it was too uh, thin and we weren't really accounting for uh, what we call it, uh, boundary layer losses. So we did notice that when we made that more of a, a circular profile, uh, meaning that it extended more outward sideways, uh, we found that we uh, experienced less losses and as a result, results gained more thrust um, from the motor. But um, for the cross-sectional area, as it travels down, it stays roughly the same um, uh, between the inlet and uh, all the way through to the exits. So, uh, totally agree. Yeah, to, to expand on what Stanley was saying, um, it's it's uh, more the duct is more of just changing shape rather than changing area at least that's the intention there and that's what the case was so the and just after the edf it just remains circular there's no convergence divergence uh after the edf yeah not that the, i i understand um what i was getting at and what jacob also put in the comment uh in the chat that converging ducts uh in subsonic flow accelerated so it might be good to just maybe make it a little bit bigger beforehand, and then you could get some added thrust there. But overall, I think that's my last thing. I don't want to take up too much time. And overall, I thought you guys did really great. And uh, you guys should be proud of this. Thank you. I, I will add real quick. Uh, our second iteration did have that in mind, actually, uh, where there was more area of, of inlet area prior to the EDF, which then, like as you're saying, would constrict the flow. Uh, increasing velocity. So uh, we did have that in mind for the second. <clears throat> okay, I'll hand it off to Jason. Thank you. Hey guys, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yep. Okay, first again, I want to commend you guys for your tremendous efforts. I think you guys are actually the only group that I consider to successfully taken off and landed. So hats off to you guys on that. I know it's really a difficult project to do. Um, last year, we were the only group to success take off and land, but loan to take off. Um, also, just like, again, like I saw from the exploded view of your actual wings, like it seems like you guys put a ton of care into this, and it's obvious just the fact that you're all here in suits right now and have a third room. But I know you guys have something that's really cracked that CAD, or you are just really good as a team to have had like this good to go integrated. So again, hats off to you guys. I think you deserve the uh, success you have. Um, so congrats. Um, good job in bouncing back and getting a good plane. 
Um, I don't really have a lot of comments. Uh, I think uh, Carl touched off on most of them. There's some things I want to clarify. The first one's just kind of silly, but I just want to ask. Um, you said you pulled inspiration from the F-16 and I think another um, jet um, to design the wings. Uh, those are supersonic jets. So I was wondering why you took inspiration from those for flying aircraft. Uh, could you repeat it again? I couldn't hear it too well. Um, I was just wondering like, why you guys took inspiration from F-16 and F-18, which are supersonic fighter jets for subsonic aircraft. Uh, well, um, well, I mean, aside from also going back to the ropes aspect of the type of force that we see the fuselage, um, and aside from the maneuverability and high speed, just that we have like also for the jumping off ground. We did, after like looking at them, uh, make a few changes in design and set our parameters, not exactly based on those. So it's just more of the jumping off point, just that we'd have some to just look at, kind of get an idea of how do we want to modify this to our own subsonic speed um, goals. And that's what led to the current parameters that were set and which were supported as well with the uh, Exaflop 5 simulations. I think something to add that is, um, you know, looking at our wing, it definitely isn't an exact mimic of the F-16 or F-18 wing. Uh, I think more what we're trying to get at is the same way the F-16, F-18 wing is designed for the types of flight parameters that that aircraft performs in, which is obviously supersonic, as you mentioned. Our aircraft wing was optimized for our flight parameters, which was high speed, but definitely not supersonic. So it's definitely not a mimic of the F-16 or F-18. It, it's actually a little bit different, but more so we tried to mimic um, the flight characteristics that our airplane performed in the same way the yeah. supersonic aircraft wings mimic their flight characteristics. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to clarify because some of the things I thought was called out, but I figured it wasn't much to do the big there. Um, I'm going to talk about your structure real quick. Um, your yield stress for the actual PLA, is that adjusted for NI subtopping? What's the, what's the question? Did you adjust the yield stress that you know for your um, your PLA? Is that adjusted for anisotropy? I can't hear you. This is for anisotropy. Yeah. At least I don't know, actually. That's just the... um. Uh, the published yield stress that I found somewhere, you know, um, that data is actually very, very scant. Um, okay. But be, so, it became an issue when we realized our, our actual stresses were so much below that. Um, so I actually just want to comment on that. So initially for our calculations, we just kind of assumed the yield stress to be isotropic, but then doing an actual test specifically along the layer height itself, since we assumed that, that would be the weakest connection points, because we ourselves were able to pull on, like in essence, the, the fibers, quote unquote, of the PLA, and it was relatively strong. But as soon as we pulled it along the direction of how it is printing, it fractured. So that's kind of what started this investigation. And then using the Instron, we were able to kind of look into some of the yield strengths shown here. Specifically, this yield strength for, we kind of identified that around 250 degrees Celsius, zero infill would provide us with um, probably the best um, yield strength that we would need, and it actually sufficed our structural cuts originally. Whereas with something oh, like we no, infill, actually ended up not being sufficient enough. So we did have to play around with temperatures and infills to kind of hone in on a specific PLA setting. However, um, if we could have more time, it would be nice to even go further than just these temperatures and infills shown here. The, the fact that you guys did that investigation is really cool. So it's awesome that you got the information on. Um, that's above and beyond the, the, what's required. So again, that's off to you. Um, just the point I was trying to make here is, I think you touched on it, but the yield stress of a printed material like PLA is usually measured along the actual um, fibers. Um, but it tends to be anastropic, like you said, when you actually go along the layers, which is how the wing is actually being loaded a suggestion that I made to other groups to like help relieve some of the stress 
um, off of the wing is to actually tape it along the span, which it seems like you guys did in your second test flight. So, again, good job, I guess. Um, one other thing I saw that I noticed is uh, you mentioned buckling being a concern of the actual uh, skin, and I believe you guys added ribs to account for that. Um, did you guys have a set number of ribs you decided to add, like based off the calculation to minimize your buckling risk? And how was that decided on to make buckling not an issue? I'm not aware of any specific um, equations for uh, for the buckling that we would experience. The the top of the wing is not planar, um, so yeah. there there are some equations for buckling in in a plane, but we couldn't use those because uh, there is that curve there. We just started off with the assumption that between the spar that we used and the ribs at each connection point for each, uh, I think the wings, that wing half span is divided into five sections. So we have a uh, we have a rib at each one of those connection points. So about five across the half span. That in addition to what we used, we just made the assumption that that would take care of any buckling issues. Yeah, and I think that's a good assumption to make. So yeah. nothing wrong with that. Um, I, what was weird to me is like the I think you guys did some shear sure slope house stuff that kind of assumes that the actual uh, skin is uh, load bearing, in which in most cases like the skin is not going to be very load bearing. Your spar is going to take like ninety five percent of the load. So um, how do you guys know in this scenario that the skin was actually structural? We made the assumption that the skin would be structural, and when we ran our cases on the shape, um, for example, the shear loading was was measured with no spar at all. So that's where where we could justify saying there's a there's a shear stress in in the skin. Um, I did not run any shear calculations with the spar in place. Okay, I would be a bit worried with that approach. Again, because most of the load is actually going through your spar, and barely any load is actually being carried by the skin. So if you uh, see your shear analysis without the um, spar, I'd be worried about the results. Um, but that takes me there. Um, can you guys show the picture of the uh, manufacturing slide? I think there's a picture of like 3D printing and like moving lines on. How much chat box in the way? So, did you guys do like a butt joint with welding the wings on? Super glue? Sorry, can you repeat that? Let me see if I can try it. Um, right here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, from what I understand, you guys, that's, is that how you guys glued on the wings? Like you just like did a little butt joint there? Uh, no, so um, we actually printed out uh, what we call a connector. So, uh, do you have a yeah picture of the CAD? Um, so we actually have um, oh, right there. Um, if you see like in between the leftmost section of the main wing, uh, and between the section that's uh not immediately to its right, but um, the the second one to its right, there's that little uh, cross sectional shape that follows the shape of the wing, and that's like. What we've been referring to as a connector and we have one of those that basically goes up the roots and then extends into the fuselage and would glue along the skin of that to glue the inside of the fuselage to the inside of the wing okay so that's that's pretty smart and the point i was going to try and make is that when you load glue intentionally compression versus shear um it tends to be much weaker but it seems like you design these two shear joints so good job on that right. Um, I saw you guys also had a picture of a wind tunnel. Do you have any data on that? That's like super cool. Um, so at least for the wind tunnel data, it specifically we just wanted to see in regards to if we were at flight conditions, what would be the thrust. So even though we tested different flight envelopes, we weren't able to process the data in time. But the main thing was that at around 35% throttle using our flight conditions, we were producing I think it was like 13 newtons of thrust. So for us, that was at least beneficial. Um, and that is again, only 17, 75% uh, throttle. Uh, it, it would have been preferred to actually process the rest of the data, but no, we, we weren't able to process it all. Okay, 
Still, um, so most of you guys did it, but if I see like a picture of like a wind funnel, like I would usually like, want to see like some data with that. But um, again, it's a mistake. Um, one more thing you guys talked about is you didn't account for losses and the duck design. Do you guys know analytically how you would calculate losses? Like how would you go about that process? Um, well, analytically, I, so uh, at least um, we talked to Dr. Abbott specifically, and he recommended us um, a fluids textbook that had an equation in it. During our redesign, we kind of glimpsed at it. Unfortunately, I don't think we have it in the slides, though. Um, but uh, specifically for us, though, it for the redesign, we didn't analytically calculate it, but we did at least consider the fact that the area increase would be substantial enough to decrease the losses. And yeah. We, we tested. Yeah. So Good. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, talking to Abbott was again smart. Um, it's very similar to kind of like pipe loss. It's just like a modification of familiar equations. Um, but as you guys learned, losses can be pretty significant, and it can result in you guys not being able to fly. Um, so just in the future, if you're trying something like this, like a long structured section, um, make sure to account for losses. You guys all know that. Um, there is formulas out there for it. It's uh, not too difficult. Um, I had a quick comment about the wing tips. It said that you guys had a 3% uh, margin of difference there. So why was that considered significant enough to actually include wing tips? I think that that's very marginal. Yeah. So, I mean, another uh, thing that I had mentioned before as well is that um, considering the fact that wing tips were snow wing tips, we, as well as the fact that like wing tips did help by a small amount, um, out of the different wing tip configurations we could potentially use, such as Reds and all the other ones that uh, we could have chosen, uh, rigged wing tips were also one of the easier ones to manufacture. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna get on your guys' case about going above and beyond, but, but usually like when you're actually looking at having wing tips to your design, you're very much going into the optimization route of the wing at that point, like you're not going to see a beat and kind of get pretty that part in one game. But it's a cool thing to add to your plane, so why not? Uh, it's just, you may guys can save some time there and focus on otherwise some stuff that's going towards the performance. Um, I had one more question, but I forgot. It's probably not a big deal. Um, anyways, really good job, guys. Like, this is incredible work for like uh, engineering students. Um, really appreciate the ambition, appreciate the heart. Glad you guys been able to capture the spirit of engineering in this. Um, great plane, very ambitious. Um, good job on putting all your requirements. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, suggestion and feedback. Um, uh, so, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> Robert, do you have any question? No, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. 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 So, so. Uh, I want to say overall, really great job, and I'm really proud of you guys. That's why uh, I asked your group to go to the um, meeting this morning. Um, and uh, just some comments, like uh, some small points. It's it's really not a big deal, but I just I'm just I was just curious, and also uh, because I woke up too early this morning, I, I didn't I couldn't focus. So I just need some clarification. Um, uh, so, so one thing that, um, let's start from page five. So, so I would like to see, so it's say, okay, it depends on air velocity, but you do have a range of the air velocity. Uh, the, well, so I would like to say the Reynolds number, you, you have a range, you put it here. Instead of just put a equation, well, equation is is universal. So, but something for your design, I would like to see a reasonable range for your estimation. Okay. Yeah. And least, I was just curious. Did you want to know the values because we do have them on hand, but we just didn't put them in the slides. 
Yes. So, so I mean, in your final reports, make sure that you you need to have you need to put a value there. Okay. Yeah, and um, and on page seven, I think they already commented on this one. So, uh, purely from presentation, what I want to say that your goal of using this symmetric L foil is um, aerobatic performance. Right, but the 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 thing that you put here is the uh, coefficient of lift and the lift to drag ratio, and it's kind of proving in another way. So it's like uh, you want to have something to prove that why you choose why why you chose the symmetric airfoil. But the 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 thing you put here is more like proof symmetric airfoil is not the best. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, right. So so if if you really want to make like I think in your explanation you give like a detailed explanation why you chose the smash air foil. Then probably when you make this slide, it's better just put like as what you just explained. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, why you chose smash air foil uh instead of cambered air foil, but not show us the um like some proof that actually prove. Symmetric airway is not the best. Okay. Yeah. So that is one thing. And uh, page nine. So from the two graphs, so probably you, your conclusion is that the augment is 26% from the leading edge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does make the Optimum L for you should be zero zero twenty six. Oh no! So this was stating, at least specifically in the previous slide, this was kind of stating the actual maximum thickness. So that's what the zero zero uh, sixteen won out for. But then specifically now, we were actually curious in Xfoil itself, it will automatically set the maximum thickness as thirty percent from the leading edge. But we were wondering what would happen if we actually change this percentage to get it like so that oh, the maximum okay. part, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, my mistake. I, so the two digits, the last two digits of four of the of let's say zero zero sixteen and sixteen is sixteen percent of the cord. The thickness yeah, is yeah. Of the cord. Yeah. okay, okay, sorry, my mistake. I thought it's the location, sorry. Um and uh page eleven. I I think I have the same comment about the group. So whenever you do some comparison, use the color of some strong contrast. Um, yeah, right now, this too is like uh, well, I can't tell, but it's it's not obvious for me. And also, I want to say one is elliptical and one is X foil. So what are we comparing here? Is X foil is X foil a software? Yeah, well, the X one was more of the uh, computational one that we uh, calculated to see what the lift distribution would be like with our uh, current uh, wind parameters. And the elliptical one is uh, just like the purity ideal one of what it would be. Okay. Yeah, so specifically kind of going off that X foil, specifically uh, XFLR, it provides us the center of the coefficients of lift along the wing for like discrete units of length, uh, specifically along the span. So we were able to actually export the data of the coefficient of lift and then convert that into a lift distribution from the program itself um, and kind of compare that with the elliptical equation provided. So it's, okay. x foil is our airplane. It's experimental versus our theoretical. x foil yeah. is, is of our airplane parameters. Yeah. So you probably, what I mean is that you should probably should change the x foil to something like clear, yeah, something else, more clear. right? Okay. Because right now, um, uh, because if I don't listen to your explanation and if you just check the slides, well, why are you are comparing X foil and elliptical? Mm -hmm. You know true. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and the next one is okay. Let's talk about structure. <laughs> Page six. Uh, my <laughs> favorite part. Um. So first for the spar, why you put a tube shape spar into consideration in the first place? 
Um, I, I, can't just the, I can't use an I beam and a box beam, but for the tube shape, I'm just a little curious. I think I just did that because um, there was another piece that was tube shaped in the lab that somebody said they were using for a spar. So um, I think that's just where the idea came from. It's oh, just a bunch of ideas. To... Also, uh, a lot of a lot of airplanes uh, can have, uh, or a lot of airplanes actually do have tube shaped spars. Um, so that is another consideration. A lot of RC airplanes do have those. Um. But but let's say just from basics, uh, the for the wind structure and wind spars, the main goal is for normal stress caused by bending. Am I right? And yeah. and if you are designing a structure that is uh, to carry the load of the normal stress caused by bending you should push more material to the two sides because the two, the sides that far before the neutral surface is the side that carries maximum load. Maximum load. That's why I can understand the I-beam, I can understand the box beam. But for the tube shape, if you remember from your maybe mechanics materials, tube shape is only efficient for torsional load. So if you have a, uh, torque, a strong torque, let's say you have um, uneven distribution of the lift in the, in, in the core direction. And you, you, let's say you want to have some structure to support the torsional load. Yes, use tube shape is best because the maximum shear stress caused by torque is on the outer surface of the tube and it's the most efficient shape. But for a structure that is mainly for carrying the normal stress caused by bending, you want to make sure, because we use MYFI, and, and Y is going to change in the cross-section. So maximum stress is top and bottom. One is tensile force stress, one is compressive stress. Um, so, so you want to push more material to the top and bottom to carry the maximum load. While, minimum, while have the minimum weight. So that is a more efficient design for uh, the wind structure, for the spot structure. And uh, the, the, on page 17, I think there is a little bit like inconsistent here. You have the lift force LX, but why you do the, you have the integration uh, VX equal to Integrate negative integration y dx. The y should be lx here. Am I right? Oh yes, yes it should. Yes, yes. It should shear force is equal to negative integration of lift distribution, which is lx dx. So, so I would prefer that you need to like in your report you make every parameter like consistent in one report. So don't put lx and y. It confuses people. So, so maybe in my lecture or in the test book, they put like VX integration Y because uh, in those situations, we normally consider Y is the lift distribution in the Y direction. But since now you have X, just, just make it consistent. You, you either use, use Y for the whole report or use LX in the whole report, right? Yes. So, so another thing is, um, I think Jacob mentioned the, the shear stress. So I, I think <laughs> there might be some confusion about the shear stress. So when you guys talk about shear stress, what cause, what is the external load cause the shear stress? Is the lift, uh, so air else or anything else? It's, uh, it's, it's, so like it's, the shear force is created by the air pushing against the wing as well. So it's the lift distribution, mm -hmm. right? It's lift distribution caused the shear force, shear stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So if it is the shear stress caused by the lift distribution, then 
you when you explain to Jacob, you say you, you are considering the the skin. Actually, <laughs> uh, if it's the shear stress caused by the transverse shear force, the lift, the lift, uh, the distributed lift, it should be zero at top and bottom, and quadratic change in between. So the actually your uh, I beam or the box beam, the, the vertical web carry the shear stress, not the skin. The skin does carry one type of shear stress, but that kind of shear stress is caused by torsional load. So as I said, let's say if you have the flap deflection, it will cause some torsional, uh, it will cause some torque of the airfoil. That shear stress will be carried by skin. Or let's say the lift distribution over the core direction is not uniform distribution. So that ununiform distribution will cause a torque. And that torque also generates shear stress. And that shear stress is caused by, um, we're carried by the skin. So you really need to be careful, like when you do the stress analysis, when you talk about normal stress, shear stress, shear stress caused by what kind of load, you need to be very clear. Um, so I, I don't agree with you guys when you explain to Jacob, when you say that uh, shear stress caused by lift and shear stress, distress is, is carried by the skin. No, it's not. It's caused by the web of the spar. Is this very confusing? Or... Well, it, it uh, makes no, sense. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So, so let's let's still go back to page seventeen. Um. Uh, and also for the uh, equation wise, tau x, v x, q x, i x, um. This equation, you, you need to do more research how to put it uh, in a correct way. It is VQ over IT for the tau uh, caused by the uh, transverse force or let's say the lift force here, but you sh cannot write it as tau of X, V of, of X, Q of S, I of, of X. It's not correct to put the equation this way. <laughs> um, and also you need to double check the definition of Q uh, first moment area from the point where the shear is zero to the point of interest, the exact definition of Q should be the uh, the area of cut section times the location, let's say the coordinate of a centroid of cut section to the axis uh, on the axis perpendicular to the neutral surface. Um, so I don't think the definition of Q here is very accurate. So make sure that when you put in the report, uh, just, just double check the equation and also the, um, the Q definition. Um, and uh, and page 18. So, so uh, I didn't see the detailed calculation, so I cannot really say much, but if the maximum normal stress is 9.26 and the maximum shear stress is also caused by the same external parallels, let's say lift distribution will cause normal stress, um, we generate bending moment and it cause the, and uh, uh, we generate normal stress. And the, this lift distribution, we have the shear force, transverse shear force and the generate shear stress. This shear stress should be several order magnitude lower than the maximum, the normal stress. So this is just, um, so maybe you can double check your calculation. Maybe there's something wrong in your calculation. Uh, I'm just surprised to see that they're in the same order magnitude because if it caused by the same force, the shear stress should be much, much lower than the normal stress. Yeah, okay, I'll double check my calculations on that. Yeah, and also one thing that I'm I'm not like uh, saying your group is wrong or other group is wrong. I I, I don't know because um, I had a presentation from this morning at night until now. Now this is the fourth group. Uh, I have seen the 
normal stress called bending from 500 to 50 to your group nine. <laughs> so I don't know which one, which group is correct, which group is wrong. It's just, um, so just make sure that you double check before you put in the report. So like every group has really different order magnitude in terms of normal stress called bending, but every group has like, well, our wingspan and everything kind of, well, it's different design, but it's very similar. It should not be that much difference, right? So I'm not saying that your group is wrong, but just make sure that when you're putting the report, double check the calculation. Yeah. Okay. And, and page 20, <coughs> it's just some uh, also, uh, you say here maximum bending moment and shear stress as functional span. But uh, what I see in the, in the graph is uh, you put as bending stress and shear stress. So I think what you guys want to say is maximum normal stress caused by bending moment and shear stress, right? Okay. It's not yeah. about the maximum. So the first sentence is you say maximum bending moment, but you, you really want to compare its stress. And in, in, the, in the graph, you put out bending stress. Normally we don't say bending stress. We say normal stress caused by bending or we just say normal stress because it is sigma caused by bending, right? Yeah. Bending stress is kind of very confusing concept. We normally don't put it in that way. So, um, sorry, I'm a little picky on the structure part. <laughs> um, and, um, and also you share one page to Jacob, the page 45. Can I see it again? Yes. So I'm just a, a little curious here at 250 degree, why zero infill is better, has better performance than 100% infill. Yes, that was actually something of great curiosity to us as well. We kind of assumed perhaps because the thickness or rather the thickness of the wall was so small, there were some, some voids or something that we were not considering in regards to actually getting this stress because the actual wall thickness itself was only 0.4 millimeters uh, compared to something that's completely, whereas if it had 100% area, it was well, all, all the area. Another thing with 100% of the area, there might be the issue of the fact that the area calculated was actually relatively off because of the fact that the printer might have to fill everything in. Um, oh, okay, okay. It, okay. There were some defects I can imagine in the printing process that we aren't quite certain about, but. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And what else? Um, so probably you guys explained this part, but I, I, I so 20, page 26. Yes. Um, probably I missed the explanation part. So you, your your trade study results. Sorry. Um, twenty seven. Uh, page twenty seven. Yes. Your trade study show that the power fund has the higher the highest value yes. overall score, but you chose the uh the best life. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So why that? As of now. Uh, well, actually, at the time, we had the power phone as a 70 millimeter EDF, whereas everything else was 64. So one of the elements was the fact that if we wanted to make a smaller plane, we would have to end up using a 64 millimeter, which we didn't quite consider in this decision matrix. Additionally, we were prompted to scale down due to the power um, to weight ratio being a little bit higher um, than what it might have needed to be. So that's why we ended up scaling down to the EDF. Okay. So, so probably you need to put those also add in the trade study. So, um, mm. because the purpose of doing trade study is to show the audience that, okay, these are the several factors we consider. And, yeah. and these are the weight factors, these are the score, and this is the total result. And I want to persuade you why we choose this one. And mm. you really want to try to do the trade study since you have different reasons, you, can put it here and in the end if you add that one you probably can have something like the overvalue the the the, the, the one you chose has a high score 
yeah. instead of yeah. instead of like do a very complicated trade study and in the end you didn't choose the one that has high score right at the time uh this pretty much the way we designed the slides is just to kind of show the story of what we were doing during the report phase and okay so this was what we were sticking to like for a good few weeks okay 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 so so if you want to use this one in the final report just make sure that you have some explanation right behind this one and uh, explain why you choose the best life yeah. Yeah. and and one thing i'm just curious on page 20 28 <laughs> uh, so why is a stabilizer you use the metal servo and later on use plastic servo yeah Pure so curious. Uh, yeah, so so the um, the metal servos actually can handle more torque. So uh, being that it's a very uh, quite a large area and we're actuating the entire area, uh, that it, it's a stabilator, uh, we assumed that there was going to be a lot more torque uh, on these surfaces. So we wanted to make sure that the servo was able to handle uh, the torque experience. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Um, and page thirty. So uh, the the table here, what's the difference of CG and GC? Well, CG is center of gravity, and GC is the minimum ground clearance that uh, we want the plane to have in order to um, fish the plane. So sorry, could you please explain explain that GC again? Oh, GC is ground clearance, like oh ground clearance. Okay, I think <laughs> it's. Well, CG can put it that way. But <laughs> ground clearance, I don't prefer you put GC there because it's it's very confusing to the audience. You know what I mean? Because not everybody know that you want to, uh, your GC means ground clearance. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Pro it. Probably people in your group knows, but people outside probably, I don't know. <laughs> um, I've just chosen to go with GC mostly for patient spacing issues. Um, so if you want to look at crowded, uh, if you have the words. Yeah, since you have enough space, just put ground clearance there, right? because if you put GC there and right after CG, people are feeling, what, what, what's that? Um, uh, and and also the, 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 the bottom two row is like LM2CG, LF2M. So um, that one, the person LM2CG, um, screen, it refers from the length that we have from the uh, main landing gears to the oh, okay. And the other one, it's a length from the front um, landing gear to the main landing gear, like this one, this one between the two gears. Okay, okay. So you guys need to figure out a clear way to make the people understand it in your final report. So I don't think it's a good idea just put like GC there or LM2CG, LF2M that, and let the audience to guess what it means. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty much all the comments I have. Um, so I think overall amazing job, uh, not just a presentation, but also the, uh, uh, the, 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 effort of you guys for the whole semester. And also um, I want to say special thanks to the team lead, <laughs> Alex, uh, because I, I didn't grade the peer evaluation, but I did read peer evaluation every week. And every time I was like, wow, like almost everyone put like 10 plus, 11 plus, and everyone could put comment like the best lead ever. So I'm really, <laughs> I feel like um, I really want to, to say thank you for your, for your strong effort to lead this group. And, and um, well, I'm glad that we have great results this semester. Um, I'm so proud of your group. And then for the, for, for, for the structure part, it's just don't, don't worry about it. It's just me have some personal issue. About <laughs> uh, <laughs> we need yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, need we accept that. all the feedback. So we much appreciate it. Um, that's kind of what this presentation is for at the end of the day. We know that not everything here was right or not everything was clear. So we kind of see what you want to see. And yeah, so, so, so don't, don't consider that like criticize or anything. It's just my person, me personally 
have some special habit to <laughs> be picky on the structural part. So um, just just make it clear in the in the in the final report should be fine. And uh, one question: um, Did you guys submit class evaluation? Yes. Wait, no. Yes, I did not. I did not. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, Make sure submit right after this presentation because uh, I checked today that our response rate is very low, and okay. I do need your feedback and suggestion to see how I can improve this class because this is just like second time I run this class in this way. So yeah. okay. I I have a lot of things to do, but I need to know how should I change. Mm -hmm. Um. So please submit the class evaluation. Um. If I say before deadline, well, you will forget tonight because you probably will go some celebration tonight. So just do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll yes. we'll uh, we'll do make it. sure that uh, everyone will leave this room when uh, peer eval has been submitted. So <laughs> thanks. Thank for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank you. so uh, thank you very much uh, for your effort for the whole semester. And uh, that's all for today. And have a great uh, weekend. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, we did it.